Welcome to the Jewish Education Experience Podcast with your hosts, Yasmina and Ari, who will be uncovering gems of wisdom with Jewish educators from around the world. To our audience, thank you so much. We really appreciate your support and we appreciate you sharing our podcast with others also. Please consider supporting our podcast financially by contributing via Zelle, Jewish Education Podcast at gmail.com, or by joining our Patreon community, www.patreon.com forward slash Jewish Education Experience Podcast. And to all of you, Jewish educators and students of Jewish education around the world, Chizchu Ve'imtsu. May you be strengthened and encouraged in your holy endeavors. And our guest today is Eileen Eisenberg, whom I actually met when we both lived in Israel. She has a very interesting career that she started for herself where she teaches drama with Jewish and Israeli themes to Hebrew school students and to youth groups. And we'll just let her talk a little bit more about that. Um, Eileen, thank you so much. We're very excited to welcome you to our podcast today. Thank you for having me. How are you? (laughs) (laughs) Thank God we're good. Um, Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you began on this journey? Absolutely. I'd love to. So uh, I think the best way to tell you about myself and how I began the journey is really what inspired me. When I grew was growing up in the suburbs of New York, I, from around the age, I'd say, of 11-ish or so, I got picked on a lot in school for having acne. And I was called every name in the book, you know? I mean, zit face, whatever you want to call it. Some people had some more uh, creative ideas with it. But it was very, very tough, you know, getting picked on with that. However, no pun intended, I had a very thick skin. And I think the reason being was, even though I was constantly ridiculed and made fun of, and I'm not going to say it was any more than the average kid who had acne or got picked on, you know, but it was something I experienced. I came home to, there were two things that really, I think, helped my self-esteem up, but also didn't allow this whole, like, you know, bullying to, to get to me. And that was that I came home to a loving family. And I also was involved in many theatrical activities after school. I always had a passion for acting. And I was involved in community theater. I did the school plays all throughout the years. I mean, the bullying went on, I'll tell you the truth, up until my first year of college. Wow. Wow. Yes. And so what happened was uh, I was also at the same time, even before even the acne started, I always loved being Jewish, you know, just something that I always appreciated. And, And even though I didn't grow up religious, so to say, I did grow up affiliated and I always wondered about the more religious people. I didn't know much about them. And, you know, all I really knew were I would see where I grew up, I would see like 15, 20 minutes, I guess, away from where I lived, a uh, Hasidic community. And all I knew was that, oh, they all know that they're all Jewish because, you know, the way that they're all dressed, but do they know that I am? And I, I always was like, I want them to know that I'm Jewish too. It was something that I really appreciated. I loved Hebrew school growing up. And what happened was all these years later, as you said, we met in Israel. And when I came back to the U.S., I started teaching drama in Jewish day camps, which led me to the Hebrew schools and youth groups and everything else. And I said to myself, you know what? I could do this with Jewish and Israeli themes, my two huge passions, very, very, very pro-Israel, very big Zionist. And on top of it, what I can do is this can be a platform uh, for self-expression for the kids. And this can help them boost confidence. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to see who's who are the kids who don't get get along, how the kids are treating each other, and what I can do to bring them together through drama, but also Jewish teachings, mitzvahs, you know, treating, being good to each other, being kind. I mean, that's really amazing. Um, What age group do you particularly work with? So I work with anything from really the ages of, I'd say, 16 to, excuse me, six, six years old to 16, 17. I'm also now working, doing it with families as activities. Like I have a Hanukkah event and now there's different synagogues are wow. having the families get involved too. But I think that the age that 
I seem to, I'd say, uh, that is the most affected by it in a positive way that really seems to understand it. Believe it or not, the six-year-olds really take to it well and understand because I think at that age, you get a lot of kids who don't always want to team up with each other, you know, or work together. Mm -hmm. And also, I see the kids that are around 12, 13 years old, I, they seem to be the ones that really seem to understand it and really pay attention when I speak about, you know, the value of Judaism in this and how it relates to what we need to do in theater and as work together as actors. I can definitely see benefits to that. How do you advertise or how do you get yourself out there? Yeah, so it's really a combination of a few things. Um, you know, before the pandemic, it was a little easier because I was doing this in person. Right now, I'm doing this via Zoom. I'm doing this all virtual right now for the uh, Hebrew schools and youth groups and everything like that. But before, like I said, but before the pandemic, I would physically go to the schools. I basically called up and I said, this is who I am. This is who I've worked with already. You know, I give them recommendation letters and I don't have such a huge social media presence as of yet, only Facebook, but it's really more of being that person who, you know, is constantly calling the different schools and telling them what I do, sending them samples of my work. And that's where, that's how they find out about me. And then they have to just trust me or, you know, they check in. I get lucky because, uh, you know, I actually had someone recently who I spoke with. She happened to uh, know one of the people I, I worked with. A can there was a cantor. Uh, she led a youth group and um, they were able to uh, recommend me. And, you know, it worked, it worked out nicely that they actually knew, knew each other. <laughs> How challenging, I guess, has it been in this period with, you know, coronavirus and just having to do everything virtually? I think the biggest challenge, well, there are two things. Budget, because, you know, you call up a lot of these schools and the first thing they tell you is, and this is, this is pretty sad. Um, they, unfortunately, they said a lot of kids um, have not uh, signed up again this, this year right. for religious school. Now, this is not the day schools I'm speaking of. And I also... Um, um, I also open this up to day schools as well, just as a side note. Okay. Uh, but the Hebrew schools are religious schools. And I know they go by two separate names. Um, a lot of them have told me that their membership has gone down because of the pandemic. Families just can't afford it anymore. Uh, I think also a lot of kids are tired of Zoom. So yeah. they don't want to do this, you know, they don't want to be on Zoom. And once they're done with their regular schoolwork, it's kind of like they don't want to continue with something else. So between either if the, the schools just don't have the funding because their budgets have gone down, or they've even told me a lot of teachers, uh, Hebrew school teachers have told me that they've had to take pay cuts. Right. Um, I'd say that's been the biggest challenge just when, you know, you tell them something like that. But when they hear, you know, the idea of putting the two thing to get things together, relating drama to Judaism and how I go about that. And, you know, just as this being more of an interactive and engaging way to teach the kids, they really like the idea. I'm sure it's a, another way of um, expression for them and a different way to learn. So I'm sure they really thrive doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They do. <laughs> the ones, you know, you know, but you get, you do get children every now and then who are, you know, shy and don't like, because it, it's the whole Zoom becomes a stage. So of what course. I do is for the ones who don't want to be involved, I find a job for everyone where we create a whole production. You know, someone's an actor, someone's the photographer, or someone's the director. It's amazing how you don't, and then I teach them that in Judaism that, you know, we need to work together and we need to support each other and be good to each other. And that's like a common thing that I do. So I give everyone a role in it. And I explain to them that it's inclu all inclusive, you know, even if you think you're not, you can't do something or you just don't want to, you're still a part of this team. You're, you're still a part of this group. For sure. Definitely. Um, so in your theater that you're teaching with them and everything, how do you find ways to talk about God? So with the younger children, it's very interesting, you know, because they're very, they're very in tune, you know, and when you speak to them and you're saying Hashem and, you know, you explain why, um, you know, being close to Hashem and loving Hashem and that Hashem loves you. And uh, I don't know if you remember, if, did you ever learn that song when you were younger? Hashem is here. Hashem is there. Hashem of course. Is here. I remember that. 
okay. So we had the same kind of uh, kinds of learning when we were younger. So, uh, you know, th those children are very, the young kids, it's like the six, seven year olds, very in tune with that idea, like an understanding that, that it's, that he's everywhere. And that, Hash and that Hashem is with you. And what I do is I explain to them, you don't have to fear. Don't fear getting, you know, if I teach the same, telling them to do improv, you have nothing to fear. You know, Hashem is with you and no one's going to judge you. And everyone here, we're all a support system. You know, everyone who's on the Zoom, the other kids, they have to applaud for you. This is part of support. And mm -hmm. I teach them, you know, it, depending on what this, uh, I just realized I started to veer off your question, but depending on what the subject is, I concentrate on the holidays a lot. Um, it's, uh, we, I just did actually my Sukkot program. And so, for example, we'll take, we'll take Purim. Purim is a great one. So you speak of Hashem. So I teach them how, you know, we don't hear Hashem's name at all in the Megillah. And I will teach them the concept of, you know, Esther and meaning hidden and how Hashem, even though you don't see him, he's still there. Just like in the whole entire Purim story, we never hear his name once. Yet he's still there and he's still with us. And, you know, and that you have, and that's just like, um. <laughs> yeah, I guess, Eileen, the only question with that song is how does it end? Is it? Do you really want to hear me sing anymore, Ari? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's just some people say that's where he can be found. And some people say that's where Hashem is found. Oh, I see what you're saying. So you're saying, are you doing the, the whole um, male-female? Well, yeah. Okay. So the way I learned the song, um, you know, that was how I remembered learning it. Wait, Hashem? That's where he can be found. That's right. Yeah, that is how that is that is that is how I learned it. I just had to like do redo the whole song in my head. Uh, you know how you do like thirty days has September, April, June, and November. I just had to do that with that with it with this song. So um, yeah, I mean, I've never really gotten specific to tell you the truth with any of the kids. It's never really. I never actually sang that song with them, but we never dealt with uh, the he or she or anything before. It's just never come up in discussion. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because I know that there are some people, like even myself, I do tend to say he just because it's just, I don't know, maybe that's what I grew up hearing. And so it just naturally comes that way. But then you think, okay, Hashem also has feminine, you know, traits too that we talk about. And it's just, uh, so it's, you know, sometimes maybe it's better if we just say Hashem and just leave it at that. But then there are other times where I guess you kind of just get in the habit of, of saying he, you know, he does this. And well, if you think um, about it, you know what I, I mean? I never, I'm definitely not someone who's knowledgeable on this subject at all. So it wouldn't be fair to me to say as to speak as if I know. But what I will say is that when you use the word he, you know, and you use the male pronoun, if you think about it, when we refer, let's take Hebrew, for example. If you have a group um, of people, boys and girls, you always go with the male plural, correct? Right. So somehow I think that has, maybe it's just a, as a general form. I don't know. That's just a thought in my head literally right now that I'm thinking how it's kind of just how it's always, I don't know, that you just go with the male form as an easier, I don't know. I was just thinking about that with how we say that when we do a plural, you know, there's no now separate thing for men and women. As a right. plural. Yeah, that is interesting, too, because when you think like Hebrew is one of those languages where it's male and female. Yeah. So so how much uh, how much is Hebrew a part of, of your education? Yeah, uh, so uh, it depends on the group. If it's a day school, it's going to be a much bigger part, obviously, because they're learning how to speak Hebrew as well. Right. When as we all um, I know, Yasmin can, um, I think, attest to this as well. Hebrew school, you didn't learn Hebrew growing up. Very little. Yeah. You, it was more, it was, was your, wait, did you go to Hebrew school separately? Yes, I went up? to public school and then Hebrew school um, separately. And then later when I was in high school, I had taken some um, Hebrew courses and a conversational Hebrew class. So, okay. So then like me, you understood that even though it was called Hebrew school, really the Hebrew you learned were really in the, we learned the tefillot and right. the, we, the Hebrew we learned were like in tefillot and, you know, here and there you learned a few couple of Hebrew words. Like I remember delet, babayit, like those, you know, 
but we you never learned how to speak the language and you know what's interesting mm-hmm. now they a lot of them call it religious school right yeah um, so I think that, uh, so, but in answer to your question, so with the day schools, there is a lot more. However, with the, uh, religious schools or Hebrew schools, especially when there isn't a lot, I speak with, I always speak with the education directors, uh, beforehand. And I, you know, tell them how important it is for me to, um, incorporate, uh, uh as much of an Israeli influence as I can. And one of those things happens to be, you know, Hebrew. So, I will always teach them like either new phrases for, uh, I'll give you an example for the Sukkot program. I taught them Muppet home, you know, and um, I said, okay, you have to use this in this little, you know, skit we're going to do. You have to say Muppet home at some point and, you know, I explain to them what it means. And even sometimes I'll even do a tongue twister, like Shir Shara Shir Sameach, like, you know, I'll do a Hebrew one just to always to keep the Hebrew going because I think it's very, I think it's so important. It really is. It's such an important language, I think, for for us to know as Jews. I mean, all of our tefillot are in Hebrew. So it is kind of sad that um, we don't use it as much, you know, in Hebrew school setting, religious school setting, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, it's a shame we have so many people not using it. But right. hopefully that's going to change. Uh, I agree. Yes. I know you mentioned you're a big uh, Zionist. So how do you teach about Israel? So I always, like I say, uh, my biggest thing are my are my holiday programs. So what I do is now that I'm doing it via Zoom, it's a little, obviously obviously a little different. So I always make sure to incorporate showing them what the holiday right now is like in Israel, because we all know that as amazing as these Jewish holidays are, you can't compare it to the way it is in Israel. <laughs> It's just, it's a whole, it's, you, you don't have to look on the calendar. You just know when it's coming. Right. And yeah, you see it in the streets. You, you, you smell it in the air. So I, I, I'll tell you something I did uh, recently. I took a picture of, um, I found it online on Yafo street. You know how on Yafo, uh, during Sukkot, that entire street is just filled with sukkahs. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we don't see that here in the U.S. where it's just going to be sukkah after sukkah. I'm talking about restaurants and cafes, you know, not sure. in particular communities. So I found a picture online of that and I showed them how, uh, you know, you can't go anywhere during Sukkot without there being a sukkah. You know, even in the littlest hole in the wall pizza place, you know, to one of the, you know, more sit down type of restaurants. And I, you know, I explained to them also something I incorporate too is that how, you know, you, the Jews, you have so many different types of Jews there, you know, and how you just, just because someone might be, not be dressed a certain way, it doesn't make them any more or less affiliated, or you can even use the term religious in the sense of, you know, you, it's what's in your heart and it's what your relationship is with Hashem. See, I said Hashem. With what your relationship is with Hashem. And a great example is, you know, I, I, I'll tell you, I was a little naive when I first got to Israel and I got on the bus once and this girl was on the bus and she was wearing really short shorts. And, you know, I, I don't really remember her shirt, but whatever. She's wearing really short shorts. And I didn't really take notice of it until I look over and you know what she was doing? She was reading Tehillim. Huh. And, you know, I said to myself, you know, would... It's not like I was looking for it one way or the other, but did I expect to see that? No, I didn't. And it really, it not, it it made me honestly look more within myself to realize, you know how we say, you know, it's, it's not up to us to judge. It really made me look within myself as much as I think I'm not a judgmental person or anything like that. You know, I'm human and that's something I need to work on. Definitely. I think we all have those moments and you know, we don't realize until I think you go to Israel, you go maybe outside of your community and you just see all the different types of people who are Jews and this person wears this and this person wears that. This person has darker skin, lighter skin. It's just um, so amazing to see. And I think, you know, it's great if we can encourage more of that. Yes. I think a lot of people aren't aware of the diversity at all. My mom actually, um, you know, my parents would always come and visit me. Um, and my mom came once and um, she came with me to, to shul on Shabbat. 
and she was speaking, um, you know, everyone like got up and said a little something who wanted to at the shul. And my mom said how, how in America, you just, if you think of a Jewish person, you kind of think of this like w one face in your mind. And when you're here, you see it's everything. It's everyone, you know, and the, the, I'll tell you, there was a lot, um, I don't know if you want me to go into this or not, but if this was any purpose of, of speaking on the subject, but even myself, there were a lot of types of Jews that I did not know in America. I did not know until I got to Israel. Wow. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, definitely. Until you go there, it's just, you don't, you don't realize how it is. Mm -hmm. In your line of work, what you're doing with the kids, how do you stay motivated? What motivates you to keep doing it? Uh, well, definitely, it's my passion for Judaism, 100%. Um, also, my passion for acting. However, it really, I think the biggest, biggest drive is that when I see what's going on with the children and how they treat each other and how they act toward each other, you know, it reminds me of when I was younger and I see how easily kids can insult each other, how easily kids can hurt each other's feelings. And for me, it's kind of like, okay, this is my opportunity to not make this person feel bad. And also to not make this person think that they can treat someone that way. It's a very big, I target bullying a lot in it. And one of the first things I do actually, whenever I teach a class is I ask, uh, you know, the, the teachers, I say, can you please tell me if there are any kids who either are bullied often or who aren't included? And I will team them up actually, but I will purposely team up the kids who aren't getting along as long, I mean, I ask for permission ahead of time because I don't want to cause a further issue, right. but I will team them up together for them to learn that they can learn from each other and that they can find something in common and maybe get, get along better. Maybe tomorrow that kid who was feeling left out or who was bullied won't be anymore, you know? And I guess now there's also kind of a challenge with like the cyber bullying, isn't there? You know, I have to say that I'm so happy, like Baruch Hashem, that I didn't grow up with that because I, yeah, I can't even imagine what that must be like. It's, right. it's and like this old, is why a lot of parents, it. I don't blame them. A lot of parents don't allow their children to have these social media, media accounts until a certain age or they right. monitor them. And I always say that I, I'm really thankful that I grew up when I did because I don't think I could have handled something like this. Or maybe I could have, I don't know. Maybe, uh we would have been doing a mini podcast together, you know, as children <laughs> and talking about it. But I mean, It's kind of reassuring what you said, though, because I feel like a good educator would be able to do exactly what you said, you know, and kind of work on both of, of the, the people involved. But now with the cyber stuff, it's like, how can you really do that? And then, you know, it's just so much more intense for, for the children. I mean, can you, you know, I'll tell you, when I was in uh, sixth grade, I walked into the girls' bathroom, and on the wall, there was something written about me. <laughs> and I remember being devastated by it, all right? All it said was, Eileen loves so-and-so. I don't even remember the boy's name. I didn't love him. <laughs> okay, maybe Those I Those were did. the days. <laughs> And I said to myself, who would write that, you know, and, and it was really embarrassing and it was so insulting. And there it was just on the bathroom wall. But imagine seeing that today on these social media sites and then other people commenting on other people making fun of you and other people laughing, you know, and that's where Jewish education is so important because one of the biggest things that I learned in the Hebrew school that I went to growing up was how we have to be good to each other. And it was all about being nice and being respectful and treating each other well. And I'll tell you something that until I got more affiliated with the like outreach organizations, I didn't, I'd hate to say this, but I didn't feel it so much from these, like the so-called, I guess, a community. There really didn't, there really wasn't a community where I grew up. I felt it within my family, but I didn't feel like I went to, you know, I didn't feel like so much that there was such a like, you know, community and this warm and, you know, loving Judaism and everything type of feeling. I didn't feel that until I got more involved and found these like Kiruv organizations in New York later on. And I think that if it, you can teach kids from an early age, how important it is to, you know, do what, how important mitzvahs are and um, why it's so good. 
important to be good to each other and not to embarrass someone and how painful that is in everything. If you can really instill that in them with Jewish education, I think you would see less of this bullying, cyber bullying and bullying in person as well. And, you know, more of just this understanding toward each other, you know, and respect, especially with adults too. Adults can be terrible with that also. I agree. Yeah. It's, it's true. Now, do you think it makes a difference if you're teaching the kids that the Torah is from Hashem versus some of the other explanations that maybe you could give them of maybe it's just good advice or maybe, you know, whatever? I think so. I think it, it would benefit to teach them that the Torah is from Hashem. And again, this is my opinion. Obviously, I know you, you asked it that way, but I just want to uh, acknowledge that I'm stating this because... If you really believe in Hashem and you think this is who created you, this is who put you on this earth, this is who felt you're important and you belong here and there are things for you to do and to be good, you're going to respect Hashem, hopefully, and you're going to fear Hashem, hopefully. And that way you would want to do better and you'd be fearful of doing bad. If you think about it, if we didn't believe in something or in, in you know, in that, that there's a higher being, that there's someone watching over us that that you know think of all the destruction we would do in this world that you know i mean that not to say people aren't into <laughs> destroying doing their you know their that there isn't destruction that that doesn't exist and hasn't existed but you know think of really how easy it would be for me to just say you know what i don't care i'm gonna just steal this sh shirt from the mall what do i care I don't, I don't, I don't, who cares, you know, or how easy it would be to, to speak badly about someone, you know, to do Lashon Hara or to make up lies about someone or treat someone poorly. If I have no fear and not worry that, you know, someone is seeing what I'm doing and, you know, then why would I care? There's no repercussions, nothing. Right. Yeah. I like that you said that because I think there's a tendency in the society we live in to just think that way. Oh, you know, no one's watching me, so it doesn't matter. I can just do this or I can do that or I can say some mean thing about someone and that there are no consequences for that. But for us as Jews, we, we know that we have to treat others with respect. And, and I agree with what you said 100%. If you, you love Hashem, you fear Hashem, you're going to do the means well, you're going to do certain things. And I think you're also going to treat other people well. I mean, at least do your best to, because you know that you have that fear of Hashem that Hashem is watching you. Hashem is, Hashem is, wa Hashem is here. Hashem is there. <laughs> Hashem. <laughs> you know, if, if you don't mind, do we have a few more minutes. Can I just share something with you that you reminded me of? Sure. Yeah, uh, so when you were just saying that, you, you reminded me of something. When I was much younger, and this is something that had a huge effect on me, um, they had dial a Jewish story. And it was a local number, and you would get a Jewish story. And I only remembered one of them. And I'll just tell you the gist of it, because I don't, I don't want to tell the story incorrectly, but it was basically about these two men who passed by a field of wheat. And one of them decided he was going to steal a bunch of the wheat. And he asked his friend to watch the field as he went to steal the wheat. And if the owner comes out to let him know, so they can, you know, go in their horse and carriage and run away. So he went out and he starts stealing the, the wheat. And the, um, after a few minutes, his friend yells out, he sees you, he sees you. Right. And so the guy ran out, got into the horse and carriage. I don't really know if it was a horse and carriage, maybe it was a donkey, who knows. And he goes, let's go, let's go. Where is he, where is he? And his friend said, where is who? You said the owner of the field, you said he sees me. And he goes, no, Hashem sees you. And that story, hearing that, it really, I might've taken it too literally sometimes in the sense of, um, you know, where maybe I didn't have to, you know, tell, you know, get, tell everyone every little thing I was doing. <laughs> but I, I really said to myself, who am I hiding from? If I lie, if I do something, if I do something sneaky or this or that, if I really believe in Hashem, I don't, not only do I not have to do such a thing, but I don't have to worry what someone else is going to think, what a human thinks. I don't need to fear the person as well, you know? Let me fear Hashem. And I'll tell you, in Israel, I took it a little too literally. I had a habit, I shouldn't admit this, of every now and then being late. <laughs> and um, one day I said to my boss, I have to tell you something. I had to wait over 40 minutes just for the bus to come. 
which was true. But then I said, but I was already 20 minutes late when I got to the bus stop. Because <laughs> you know, Hashem was watching. That's it. It's true. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Oh my goodness. It's the truth. <laughs> and I didn't get fired. I guess she liked the honesty. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually a good lesson for the cyberbullying because, you know, it's like all of your deeds are recorded in a book. It's like you can kind of show them, like you put this online. I mean, it's 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 always there. And you know, uh, it's that's kind of, amazing. It's, it's easy to kind of visualize that everything is being watched. That's, you know, amazing that you said that because can you imagine, you say recorded in a book, these kids looking at this like 15, 20 years from now? wondering how they might have really hurt other people wow right yeah it's like kind of like you know our generations like we think of you know if you get a picture of like your grandparents or your great grandparents it's like wow there's that one picture you know and these kids it's like from the day they're born it's like all there yeah you know that's so true oh my gosh scary. it's actually a little scary <laughs> well you know right now we're kind of um I, well, we're not, we're definitely not back to like pre-technology days, but um, we are we are doing things uh, very differently, you know. Like all of a sudden, people don't want to be on the internet so much. People want to be outside more, you know. People want to do the things that you did before we were so involved in technology because right. we can. Yeah, I think everybody maybe, wants. Maybe it's good that the kids are getting Zoom fatigue, and maybe they'll just give it all up. Yeah. <laughs> Focus on some other things. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, listen, think about it. But really, like, you know, all of a sudden, it's like, even the kids have had enough of the electronics, you know, they want to go bike riding, they want to go hiking, they want to, they want to be outside just taking a walk. I mean, even me, you know, I don't know about you guys, I realize I appreciate so much more now the fresh air. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right, well, I'm going to ask one last question, and it's a little bit of a challenging one. Okay, I like a challenge. Go ahead. <laughs> if my brain freezes, that's just my excuse of I got to not think of an answer. Just we'll see, because Hashem knows. Hashem knows. Well, yeah. <laughs> that's what brain freeze means. <laughs> um, what does successful Jewish education look like to you in the future? I think that when you combine, if you can, you know, you're never going to find a uh, perfect Jew, so to say, right? You find the one who dobbins three times a day and, you know, um, wears a kippah and, you know, is constantly quoting the Torah and keeping kosher, but he might be doing a lot of bad things. You know, maybe he's not being honest in his business. Maybe he speaks a lot of, you know, negativity about people, a lot of Lashon Hara. Maybe he doesn't treat people nicely. Uh, who knows? Okay. And then you find the opposite, someone who is a great person and just really does the, I mean, again, no perfect person, but really tries their best not to speak badly about people, tries to be as honest as possible as they can in their business dealings and everything else. But you know what? I don't need to fast on Yom Kippur. That's something they did ages ago. You know, I don't need to eat matzah, please. That's, you know, we had to do that when we left Egypt, you know, any of this stuff. I think that when you can find someone who can find just as much importance in both, where, you know, obviously you can't find perfection, but where they really can, where there's a really good balance where they understand that both are important. It's not just... I went to shul today. It's not just I dominated. It's not just, oh, I fasted on Yom Kippur. It's like, you know what? Okay. I did good. I had a really, I had a chance to really speak negatively about someone and I didn't. And it's, wow, you know what? I, I was able to, um, I had some extra time today and I was able to do some davening. Um, it's when you do the best you can and you know, obviously you don't want to, it, that can be a lot of pressure on a human being, you know, but where you understand that both are equally important and you try to incorporate both into your lives because it's very easy um, to, to, to misunderstand or mis to misconstrue what being a good Jewish person, in my opinion, is a good, there, th those three words, good, Jewish and person. See, no, I didn't say good Jewish man, or good Jewish woman. I said good Jewish person. And that's the thing. You do the Jewish stuff, you do the good stuff, because the Jewish stuff is the good stuff, you know, and the good stuff is the Jewish stuff. You can very easily do them, but you can't forget that they, that they go hand in hand. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that is true. And it's really going to be interesting to see in the future how things look, especially once this virus ends and things kind of settle down a bit. I really think that this is shaken up. Yeah. The world, the Jewish world and schools and all of that. So uh, I guess we're going to be on this ride and this educational journey, just kind of seeing how things go. Yes. And uh, yeah, and Bezrat Hashem, they will, um, things will keep getting better and better. Amen. I'm into and, and that. Hopefully we'll, uh, we'll have to get you back on, uh, you know, post pandemic and, and see where we're at. <laughs> yes, absolutely. 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 And I got um, some questions for your wife as well. <laughs> Not for your podcast. <laughs> your podcast. You have the good questions. Um, well, I'm glad that you were able to join us this evening. And we really had a great time getting to talk with you and learn a little bit more about um, what you do and everything. And we just wish you all the best in your endeavors. And hopefully we'll see you in Israel. Thank you so much for having me. I really loved your questions and you really, you know, you spoke about a lot of things that really spoke to me that I haven't thought about in some time. And you just, you, you, I don't know, you, you brought back some good, some good memories of things when, when a lot of the questions that you asked. So I also appreciate that. And thank you for having me. This was really enjoyable. I really, I really liked it. Yeah. Thanks so much, Eileen. We're looking forward to going back to and listening to it again and getting, getting, yes. uncovering some more gems from. Yes. And I'll see you guys in Israel. Perfect. Perfect.